talk today about fasting. I say amen, amen or oh me. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Today's sermon title is fasting. Got questions? Got any questions about fasting? When's it over? <laughs> Good question. January 24th. We are on a 21 day Daniel's fast. I'll speak more about what that is here. Uh, in this message. But, uh, I hope that you will join us. We started this past week. Today is uh, the seventh day, and uh, we'll be breaking the fast uh, in two weeks from today after the morning service is over. Our scripture text, though, is found in Ezra chapter 8. Ezra 8, and we'll pick it up in the middle of verse 21. Ezra was speaking. He said, I gave orders for all of us to fast and humble ourselves before God. We prayed that He would give us a safe journey and protect us, our children, and our goods as we travel. For I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to accompany us and to protect us from enemies along the way. After all, we had told the king, Our God's hand of protection is on all who worship Him. But his fierce anger rages against those who abandon him. So we fasted and earnestly prayed that our God would take care of us, and he heard our prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful today for the opportunity to open up your word. I pray, God, that you will speak life to us today through your word. I pray that, Lord, that you will guide us, direct us, lead us, and use us, Father, and use this word to accomplish its intended purpose by you in each of our lives. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, and holy name. Amen. Amen. So how many of you know people who, who regularly practice fasting? For those of you that have been fasting this first week of our 21-day fast, let me say to you, thank you. Praise God for what you're doing, and keep up, keep it up, keep up the, the good work. Press on, don't get weary in your well-doing. But for those of you that are fasting, have you ever had this thought? Why do they call it a fast when it goes by so slow? Fasting is one of the most feared and the most misunderstood of all the spiritual disciplines. Many Christians don't do it because they don't know what the Word of God says about it. By the time you leave here today, I hope that you will have a much better understanding of what fasting is and why we do that. Some believe that fasting will turn us into something that we're afraid of, that we don't want to become and that it will cause things to happen in our lives that just might make us undesirable for friends. Or that people will look at us weird. Or we'll somehow we'll turn into these Jesus freaks and nobody will want to be around us. Don't worry, that's not going to happen. You need a better understanding of what fasting is. We need to understand that the Bible has a lot to say about fasting. And do you, you realize that the Bible speaks more about fasting than it does about something as important as baptism? It does. So I'm going to try to answer some of the questions about fasting. The, the who, what, when, why, how, those kind of questions. I hope to answer those for you today. So I hope you're taking notes, especially if you don't have a good grasp of fasting. And even if you've been practicing it for years... Go ahead and take some notes anyway. You might, you might learn something new, or it might be something that you're going to need to share with somebody else. So what is a fast? Question one, what is a fast? Here's a definition. Fasting is a Christian's voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. Notice the key words. Christian, voluntary, and it's for a spiritual discipline. Fasting is a spiritual discipline 
that believers will embark upon on their spiritual journey in growth in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fasting is a believer being willing to give up physical desires because they want the things of God more than they want of the fleshly things. So who should fast? All Christians, that's the right answer. Matthew chapter 6, in that chapter, in fact, college students, tonight we're, we're going to read Matthew 6, we're going to look at it, we'll talk about this tonight. So for those of you that are going to get back into G2, you just kind of get ready if you want to this week. Read Matthew 6, kind of get in that habit once again of looking back at the Word of God and seeing how you can apply it to your lives. But in Matthew chapter 6, a quick synopsis, Jesus says three really big things talking to the believers, the disciples, and you would fall into that category as a believer, as a disciple. So he's speaking to you, and three things that really jump out at us. The first is where he says in this chapter, he says, when you give. Now, do we expect that Christians should be givers? Yes. Is that reasonable? Does, does the Lord expect you as a believer to be a giver? Yes. yes. Yeah, we can support that with a whole lot of scripture, right? Okay. He later, he says in that chapter, when you pray. Should God expect believers, His children, to pray? Yes. Is that reasonable? Is that reasonable for God to expect His children to pray and talk to Him? Amen. He later comes in the chapter and He says, When you fast, when, not if. So if it's reasonable that when we see that God says, when you give and we realize as a believer, oh yes, I should give. And when he says, when you pray, oh yes, as a Christian, that's my responsibility. I need to pray. I need to talk to God. But then when he says, when you fast, we go, wait a minute, that's for somebody else. But it's not for somebody else. That's for you as a believer. As a child of God. This is something that God expects all of His children to do. So He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. So the who of it is you. Us. Me. All of us. When should we fast? Well, any time. You, you can fast any time. You can, you can do a fast. You can do a one day fast. You could do a one meal fast. You could do a 40 day fast. You could do a 21 day partial fast, like we're doing the Daniels fast. Here at New Life Church of God, along with millions of other Christians around the world, we join together at the beginning of the year to consecrate ourselves to the fast. So we, we're setting the stage for the rest of the year. We're saying, God, we want to consecrate 2016, and we want you to bless this year. We want this year to have the favor of God upon it. We want our lives to have the favor of God upon it this year. We want to be used by you this year. And so we're calling out to you in fasting and in prayer, asking you to bless the remainder of our year as we set aside the very first. Kind of like tithing, how God asked us to give the first fruits, and to give the, the first portion, that give that first 10% to the, to the Lord. In the same way, we are giving the first part of our year to the Lord, consecrating ourselves, setting this aside at the very beginning to honor the Lord, to seek the Lord, to call upon Him, and to grow our spiritual lives. So that's why we do that at the beginning of the year. Do you have to do it when we do it? No. But I would encourage you to do this because it's a whole lot easier when you have the support of a church, when you have the support of other brothers and sisters that are around you who are doing this all at the same time. That they are there to be an encouragement. They are there to cheer you on. They're there to motivate you. Uh, they may be there just to put their arm around you and you two cry together because you're hungry. <laughs> but it's a whole lot easier to do it when you're doing it together. And so I encourage you, join us. Maybe this is the first time you've heard about this. 
And you're thinking, well, you know, I didn't start. Just start now. You can break the fast in 14 days when we do, but I would encourage you, start now. Join us on this fast. Sound like a good idea? So I want to answer some of the how we should fast questions, and then I'll answer the, the why, okay? So very quickly, I'm going to go through eight different fasts that I see in the Bible. Eight different fasts. So get ready to, to write quick, okay? Number one is a normal fast. A normal fast is abstaining from all food, but not from water or juices. In, in Luke 4 and 2, it says that Jesus ate nothing, and he did that for 40 days in the, in the wilderness. It doesn't say that he didn't drink anything. And since the body can't normally function any longer than about three days without water, we assume that Christ drank water during this time. That is the, a normal fast. Secondly, is a partial fast. In a partial fast, you're limiting certain types of food, but it is not abstaining from all food. In Daniel 1 and 12, it tells us that for 10 days, Daniel and three other Jewish boys, they, they are young men, they, they ate only vegetables and drank water. Some of you right now are probably thinking, why are we doing this for 21 days when Daniel did it for 10? Because later in Daniel chapter 10, it, he does this fast again, and it was for 21 days. You can read it. Read Daniel chapter 10 if you want to see this. And it's Daniel's partial fast. And we are, we are following this. We're eating fruits and vegetables. We're drinking water and juices. That means so we're, we're, we're skipping meats and breads and sweets. All the things that I really love. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, skipping all those things. Not not drinking coffee. Oh my Lord. I miss my morning coffee. But there's a purpose. Not drinking sodas. That's a good thing. Some of us need to just get off the soda, don't we? Leave the wine behind. Water. Juices. Okay? I encourage you to join us on a fast. That's a partial fast. Number three is a complete or absolute fast. This is the avoidance of all food and liquid. We're told that, that Ezra, in Ezra 10, 6, and then also in Esther and also the Apostle Paul, they abstained from all food and drink, but it was for a very short period of time. Okay? There's a supernatural fast that's found in the Scripture where the Bible talks about this fasting. It was with Moses when he went to Mount Sinai and he, he had this 40-day encounter with God in Deuteronomy 9 and 9. He said, and I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water. Now, this is a supernatural fast. It requires God's supernatural intervention because it is not possible without God doing the miraculous for that to, to happen. Now, you do not call yourself to that. It would be a specific calling from God and God would miraculously provide for you in your life. A supernatural fast. There's a private fast. And this was the type of fast that Jesus was referring to in Matthew chapter 6 when he said that we should not do it in order to be noticed by others. Then there is a congregational fast. We see it in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. In Joel chapter 2 verse 15, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. A sacred assembly. Call the congregation, your people together, and call a fast for the church. A congregational fast. In Acts 13, 2, and it says, while they, and they mean the church, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barabbas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So it was a time in which the church was fasting, worshiping, seeking the Lord, that God said, I'm going to take a couple of you out of the church. I'm going to take Paul, Saul, and Barnabas, and you are to send them forth to go do evangelistic ministry. 
congregational fast. So at different times, church leaders will call the whole assembly together for this kind of fast. How about this one? I'd love to see this. Number seven, national fast. King Jehoshaphat was, as leader, was experiencing an invasion from a foreign army. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, it says, Alarm, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. So several times, the nation of Israel was called to a national fast. We see Nehemiah, we see it in Esther. How I wish that we would have godly leaders that would call our country to a fast. As elections get closer, we ought to make it a time of fasting and praying for that. Oh, yeah. Number eight is a regular fast. There was a regular fast that God commanded under the Old Covenant, the old, in the Old Testament there. Every Jew was to fast on the Day of Atonement. And while they were in captivity in Babylon, they were to be fasting and and leaders then instituted that there would be four annual fasts. It's found in Zechariah 8. So the question then, why should we fast? And I'll spend a little bit more time on this one than the others. Why? Let me first say that you cannot use fasting to impress God on your spirituality. You don't use it to impress God into acceptance. A sinner is not going to go on a fast, impress God, so that God says, oh, you need to become my child. But God makes salvation a whole lot easier than that. Whenever we fast, we should do so with a particular reason or purpose. You want to dedicate this year to the Lord. You want to consecrate your life before the Lord. You just want to be obedient to the pastor's call and challenge to join the church to fasting. It's a purpose. You want to be obedient to the government leader that calls a national fast. But that's a real purpose. So what are the purposes of fasting? I'll give you nine of them. Here's the first. To strengthen our prayers. Strength and prayer. There is something about fasting. It sharpens our edge. It, it gives a passion to our prayers. When Ezra was about to lead this group of exiles back to Jerusalem, he proclaimed a fast in order for the people to seek the Lord earnestly for a safe passage. You see, there were many dangers out there. They were going to be making a 900-mile journey on foot. And they were going back to their homeland that had been, it had been destroyed, it had been pillaged. They didn't know what they were truly going to face. And there were many dangers out there. And they weren't going to have a police or military convoy or protection with them. So they sought God. And it said, and God answered our prayers. The most important aspect of this discipline of fasting is its influence on our prayers. Fasting is not some hunger strike in which we're going to force God to do something or else we die. We're not going to manipulate God. Fasting is not so much about changing God as it is about changing us and our perspective and sharpening us and inspiring us and challenging us and the Holy Spirit working on us and in us. It's to strengthen our prayers. Second, it's to seek God's guidance. There's a biblical precedent for fasting to more clearly discern and to hear, to understand the voice 
and the will of God for our lives. So we fast to seek God's guidance. In, in Judges chapter 20, 11 tribes of Israel were preparing to go to battle against one of their other, the 12th and rebellious tribe. And they were going to go into battle. They outnumbered the Benjaminites 15 to 1. And it does say that they prayed, asking for God to bless them, and they went into battle, and they lost, and 22,000 men died. All in all, they had lost 40,000 men in trying to fight against their brother. But then they stopped and said, well, well we need to fast and pray. And after they prayed and fasted, then the Lord told them He would give them the victory. Paul and Barnabas prayed before they ever anointed elders in a church where they had found them. They prayed and they sought for God's guidance in who to appoint. Fasting does not ensure that you're going to receive clear guidance from God, but it sure makes us so much more receptive to hear His voice and receptive to His guiding in how He leads. Here's the third one. You might not have known this one. To express grief. Three of the first four references to fasting in the, in the Scriptures are connected to an expression of grief. Like Judges chapter 20, the Israelites wept and fasted, seeking God for guidance and to express their grief over the 40,000 men they had lost in battle. When King Saul was killed by the Philistines, when the men of Jabesh, Gilead, it says they learned it, they fasted and prayed for seven days after his burial. And then when David heard the news of, of Saul's death, 2 Samuel 1, 11, then David would... And all his men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of, of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. So they were fasting as an expression of their grief. Fourthly, to seek deliverance for protection. For protection, excuse me. To seek deliverance or protection. One of the most common fast in biblical times was to pray and seek God for salvation or deliverance from an enemy or from circumstances. We see Ezra did, did that. We see other times. But he said, he, so we fasted and petitioned the Lord about this and He answered our prayers. Israel was a rebellious people. I mean, they would serve God. They were God's chosen people. And there were times they were red hot and they were serving God faithfully and then things would happen and, and the nation would start being blessed and people would get comfortable and they'd start relaxing and they'd start allowing just anything to enter into their lives, into their society. And they'd rebel against God. Pretty soon they'd be wheels off the wagon, it's in the ditch, and that's, they're just living astray without him. And then God would send something to cause them to wake up Paul. He, he, he may allow another nation to come in and begin to torment them or take them over. And then, and, 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 oh God, help us! And they're so much like us, aren't they? Miss... Fasting, rather than the fleshly efforts, should be one of our first defenses against persecution. If you're facing persecution, don't just bow up and think, I'll handle this. I'll tell you a thing or two. Why don't you tell God a thing or two about it and, and go to Him with fasting and prayer? Here's a fifth one. Express repentance and return to God. We fast in order to express repentance and return to God. See, repentance is 
It's a change of mind, but it results in a change of action. Repentance is the turning around, the turning away from what we, what we were chasing after. Fasting can, it can signal that obedience to a new direction. In 1 Samuel 7, 6, it says, When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, get this, they fasted, and there they confessed, we've sinned against the Lord. They fasted and they repented. Joel 2, it says, Even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. So you, in your rebellious nature, your rebellious state, turn away from it, repent, cry out to God with prayer and with fasting. Why don't you show him that you really need it? I'm tired of playing the games. I'm tired of the pretend. And I'm serious about walking this life of faith with you. And so I repent, and I'm going to go before you with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Number six is to humble oneself before the Lord. We humble ourselves before God. When fasting is practiced with the right motives, it is a physical expression of humility before God. One of the most wicked men in Israel's history was King Ahab. And God was pronouncing judgment upon him. And in that, he was like, Oh God, what have I done? But he took it far and much. It wasn't just that. It was, Oh God, how can I? Oh God, I humble myself before you. So much so, he truly got God's attention in 1 Kings 21. Beginning at verse 27, when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. True, humbled himself before God. Fasting is not humility before God, but it is an expression of our humility before Him. The, the story in, in Luke 18, and Luke is verse 12, is where the, the Pharisee is standing in the temple and He's praying out loud. Oh God, I'm glad I'm not like tea sinners. For I pray and I fast twice a week. Look at me, God. How great I am. Look at all that I do for you. Is that good? Seventh one is this. To express concern for the work of God. To express concern for the work of God. Christians may fast and pray, and because they they may fast and pray because they feel a burden for the work of God in one particular area. One might feel compelled to fast and pray for a specific ministry that is within the church. 
feel compelled to fast and pray and pray for our college ministry, I encourage you to do that. You might be fasting and praying about a particular area of ministry that where you see a need, but it's not being met within the, the local church. And you might feel like you need to fast and pray and seek God about it. God raised somebody up. But God bring about God bring about an opportunity for somebody to do this. It might be God bring about an opportunity for me to reach out. It may be God's burden you because He wants to do something in your life, giving you some guidance, because He's wanting to lead you into an area. This was the purpose of Nehemiah's fast. Nehemiah had heard that despite the, the return of many Jewish exiles to Jerusalem, that the city there still had no walls to protect it. There's no way for the people to, to defend themselves. So after fasting, Nehemiah, he, he feels compelled that he goes to work to do something that was very tangible, very real, in order to strengthen the, the walls, to strengthen the city to protect God's people. He saw a need, so he began to fast and pray and seek the Lord. Out of that, God moved him to action to do something about it. Two more. The eighth one is to overcome temptation. To overcome temptation. Matthew chapter 4, the first 11 verses, it talks about when Jesus fasted for those 40 days. Jesus did so with a purpose because Jesus was about to be tempted by the enemy. There would be a big spiritual battle that Jesus had to face. But Jesus fasted and prayed those 40 days. Prepared his life and Satan showed up. Uh, Satan showed up tempted. Such a biggest understatement in the Bible, right here. Jesus fasted for 40 days, and it says he was hungry. Okay. You had eaten for 40 days? Oh, he was hungry. I've been eating all week. I mean, I feel like I'm eating non stop, but it ain't satisfying. And so it feels like I'm just constantly hungry. Am I starving? No. Have I missed a meal? Not really. I've eaten stuff that just wasn't satisfying. I've been, I, I felt hungry. I didn't go without food for 40 days. I can't imagine. The one time I did, I fasted for three days. No, no food for three days. He was hungry? Oh, my Lord. I felt like my stomach was about to explode on the inside. But Jesus did that with a purpose. To prepare himself for the temptation which he overcame. Yes. And after overcoming those temptations, it was then that God was about to launch him into his public ministry. But he had to prepare himself first. So he dedicated himself. He prepared himself. He was ready for his public ministry. The scripture never reveals any specific length of time that we are required to engage in fasting. We can't look in the word and say, oh, I want to overcome temptation, so that requires a 40-day fast. Not how it works. Need to repent, so that's going to require a three-day fast. I need guidance, so 10 days. doesn't tell us exactly how or how long. 
But it tells us we should, that we're supposed to. Maybe you've never fasted before. You're thinking, I don't know if I can do this. Then why don't you take tomorrow and just do one day? Start with that. Take one day. Don't eat. Just liquids. Try it. You don't think you can handle that? Just start with a meal. There'll be one that says, well, I'm a fast lunch. So 11.45, you're eating this giant snack. And 2 o'clock, you're eating your next snack. You're doing that. Why not join us on our 21-day Daniel's fast? Let me give you the ninth one. And that's to express love and worship to God. To express love and worship to God. When you're done writing that down, would you stand with me? When you're done writing that down, would you stand with me? Let me talk to you about this one. I'm going to close out. Fasting can be our act of worship before the Lord. It is a form of worship. In Luke, the second chapter, Luke chapter 2 is the Luke's account of when Jesus, his birth, and, and it talks about his early life right there during that, that first year. You know, he's he circumcised at eight days old. He's presented into the temple. It speaks about when his parents then go back again to, to make a, a, a the sacrifice. And, and while there, they, they encounter, I believe it's the prophet Simon. They had this other encounter with Anna. Luke 2.36. There was also there a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Don't you just love that? The honesty of the Bible. And she was old. She had lived with her husband. Look at this. This is sad. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And I don't know exactly how old a Jewish girl was when she typically got married, maybe 15, 16. So she lived with her husband for seven years, so now she's 22, 23, and he dies. And then it basically says there, oh, let's read. And then she was a, a widow until she was 84. She never had left the temple, but worshipped night and day. Day and night. Fasting and praying. Worshiping, fasting, praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So this godly woman had dedicated more than half her life, actually, well, more than half a century to day and night worship of God, characterized by fasting and praying. It's her act of worship to fast, to pray, to seek the Lord. Fasting honors God and it is a means of worshiping Him. Why not try this as your act of worship? Fasting can be an expression of your greatest pleasure, which is to be in the presence of God, and it can be for His enjoyment. Put a big smile on his face as he looks down. He says, oh, that's my boy. Look at him fasting, worshiping me. Fasting 
Fasting means that your stomach is not your God. That your stomach is not going to rule and control your life. Instead, you are God's servant. And fasting proves that you are more hungry for the things of God than the things of this world. Fasting is a privilege. It's not an obligation. It's a privilege. And you should look at it that way. It is a privilege for me to be able to do, to do this before the Lord. It is my act of worship before the Lord God for all that He has done in my life. So I challenge each of you, if you call yourself a child of God, then commit yourself to a time of fasting. You can join us. You may do it completely different. I'm okay with it. You might do it next week or next month. important thing is that as a believer that you do that and to be obedient to that because the Bible says when you fast so I hope I've answered some questions about it today I hope I've challenged you today and I hope I challenge you to go deeper into your relationship and your walk with God and if you've been one that's been saying, I, you know, I, I want to grow in the Lord. I want to see my, my spiritual walk develop. I want to be closer to God. I want to have a greater intimacy with God. I want to be able to hear and recognize His voice as He speaks to me. Then be obedient and fast. As you can see, all those things take place. I'm going to ask our prayer team to go ahead and come on down, please. Or maybe some desiring prayer today. And we want to give them an opportunity to be able to respond to the Lord. Father, I pray over your people. 